Good morning, everyone, from beautiful Cape Canaveral, Florida, here at the port. We're glad you're with us this morning. We are live, and uh, wherever you're at, uh, I'd like for you right now to join me in going to our Heavenly Father and just asking Him for our blessing, for His blessing, on this time together. Father, we do come before you to ask you for your blessing, to overcome our weaknesses, to enlighten our eyes, to interpret uh, your word into our ears so that it will penetrate our heart. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. I'd like to uh, start with our uh, time together this morning with a little song here. And uh, I really, I kind of identified with this song, and I hope that you find something that you can identify with it too. Grandma used to pray out loud by her bed every night. To me it sounded like mumbling, like she was out of her mind. She said, boy, this kind of praying is what saved my life. You ought to try it sometime. Now I know she was right. She was talking to Jesus. She was talking to Jesus. She'd been talking to Jesus. Drag me to church Sunday mornings and Wednesday nights Khaki pants and a polo shirt Boy, I'd put up a fight She said, son, one day you'll thank me For having God in your life and Yeah, I know she was right yeah, my mama was right Cause now I'm talking to Jesus She got me talking to Jesus She got me talking to Jesus Yeah, my mama was right Cause now I'm talking to Jesus I love talking to Jesus I'll be talking to Jesus for the rest of my life. What a friend we have in Jesus. What a friend we have in Jesus. What a friend we have in Jesus. Oh, what a friend we have in Jesus. What a friend we have in Jesus What a friend we have in Jesus Oh Got three of my own now <clears throat> Trying to raise him a bride My oldest is 15 I remember what that was like Trying to deal with the drama Figure out the questions in life and I've been looking for a way to show him How to make it alright Then he walked in my room While I was saying my prayers the other night He said I'll come back later Said it's not an interruption. You couldn't have picked a better time. Cause I just talking to Jesus. Come and give it a try. We started talking to Jesus. We started talking to Jesus. We started
started talking to Jesus. Whoa, now he's talking to Jesus. Thank God he's talking to Jesus. I hope he's talking to Jesus for the rest of his life. What a friend we have in Jesus. in that song that wherever you are, whether you are in Asia or Europe or Africa or South America or North America or Australia, wherever, even if you happen to be in Antarctica, you can talk to Jesus wherever you are. So our Bible study this morning brings us to one of the most famous passages in all of Scripture, and it is 2 Samuel 11. And I want to read the passage, and again, many of you will uh, already be familiar with this story. In the spring of the year, when kings normally go out to war, David sent Joab and the Israelite army to fight the Ammonites. They destroyed the Ammonite army and laid siege to the city of Rabbah. However, David stayed behind in Jerusalem. Late one afternoon, after his midday rest, David got up out of his bed and walking on the roof of the palace, as he looked over the city, he noticed a woman of unusual beauty taking a bath. He sent someone to find out who she was, and he was told she is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Then David sent messengers to get her, and when she came to the palace, he slept with her. She had just completed the purification rites after having her menstrual period. Then she returned home. Later, when Bathsheba discovered she was pregnant, she sent David a message saying, I'm pregnant. Then David sent word to Joab, Send me Uriah the Hittite. So Joab sent him to David. When Uriah arrived, David asked him how Joab and the army was getting along and how the war was progressing. Then he told Uriah, Go home and relax. He even sent a gift to Uriah after he'd left the palace. But Uriah did not go home. He slept that night at the palace entrance with the king's palace guard. When David heard that Uriah had not gone home, he summoned him and asked, What's the matter? Why didn't you go home last night after being away for so long? Uriah replied, The ark and the armies of Israel and Judah are living in tents, and Joab and my master's men are camping in the open fields. 
How could I go home to wine and dine and sleep with my wife? I swear that I would never do such a thing. Well, stay here today, David told him, and tomorrow you may return to the army. So Uriah stayed in Jerusalem that day and the next, and David invited him to dinner and got him drunk. But even then he could not get Uriah to go home to his wife. Again, he slept at the palace entrance with the king's palace guard. So the next morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and gave it to Uriah to deliver. The letter instructed Joab, Station Uriah on the front lines where the battle is fierce, then pull back so that he will be killed. So Joab assigned Uriah to a spot close to the city wall where he knew the enemy's strongest men were fighting. And when the enemy's soldiers came out of the city to fight, Uriah the Hittite was killed along with several other Israelite soldiers. Then Joab sent a battle report to David. He told the messenger, Report all the news of the battle to the king. But he might get angry and ask, Why did the troops go so close to the city? Didn't they know they would be shooting from the walls? Wasn't Abimelech, son of Gideon, killed at Thesbeth by a woman who threw a millstone down on him from the wall? Why would you get so close to the wall? Then tell him, Uriah the Hittite was killed too. So the messenger went to Jerusalem and gave a complete report to David. Then he came out against us in the open fields, and he said, We chased them back to the city gates. As we chased them back to the city gates, the archers on the wall shot arrows at us. Some of the king's men were killed, including Uriah the Hittite. Well, tell Joab not to be discouraged, David said. The sword devours this one today and that one tomorrow. Fight harder next time and conquer the city. When Uriah's wife heard that her husband was dead, she mourned for him. When the period of, the morning, of her mourning was over, David sent for her and brought her to the palace, and she became one of his wives. Then she gave birth to a son, but the Lord was displeased with what David had done. Now, if you've been with us this time, all these uh, days, you, you know that uh, these, these things are recorded for us in the Scripture for three reasons. One, they actually happen. Two, they're written for us, for us to learn from them. And, and three... And the most important one is they point us to Jesus. And so as I was looking at this story in light of those three givens, uh, I saw four main characters come to mind. And so this morning I want to approach our time together looking at these four main characters. The first one, obviously, is David. By this time, he's firmly entrenched as king of all of Israel. And yet, here he is at the height of his apex. He has he is gone through all of his life and he has now reached the pinnacle of success. He's at the highest point he's ever been in his life. He makes a serious mistake, a fatal mistake. And, and Whatever situation we find ourselves in, we would do well to avoid making this kind of mistake. And, and, and we don't want us, we don't want our story to, to be written with the last words that Samuel wrote in this chapter, but the thing David did displeased the Lord. So let's look at David. It was springtime. It was time when when the kings go out to battle. It was time when, when the kings would lead their armies out into the fray. But David stayed in Jerusalem. And we're not sure why he did this. Uh, maybe he was just tired of the bloodshed and the fighting and, and just wanted to take a break. Uh, what we do know is this. He wasn't where he was supposed to. Maybe he thought, I've arrived. I don't have to be out there anymore. My man Joab can take care of all this for me. But uh, not being where he was supposed to be, he's now doing things that he normally wouldn't do. And so here he is taking an afternoon nap. And he wakes up and, you know, 
I'm sure he's thinking, well, what am I supposed to do now? And so he just gets on the palace roof and he takes a stroke. The deal is, is that there's a lot of truth to the adage that we we kind of made this uh, proverb into our own uh, worriage, but uh, idle hands are the devil's workshop. And when we are not where we're supposed to be, whether that be physically, or mentally, or spiritually, all of the above, we become a target of our enemy. And we know from the New Testament that uh, our enemy's only goal is to seek and devour. And that's what he did here with David. Okay, we saw in verse 2 that as he's taking this stroll after his nap, he sees this most beautiful woman. Now that first glance, that first look, was not the sin. Those things happen all the time. But David then went past the first look. He then inquired to who she was. We know from James chapter 1 that each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. That describes exactly what happened to David. I wonder if James may not have had this incident a thousand years uh, before in Israel's history in mind when he wrote those words. So we know what happens. He sends for her. He sleeps with her. He sends her away to her own house. She sends word back to him that she's pregnant. His sin has now put him in a bind. What do you do in that situation? Whether you have found yourself in this particular situation or any other situation where your sin has put you in a bind, what do you do? What is your response? Well, a good rule to live by, whatever the situation is, is when you find yourself in a hole, quit digging. David kept it. What he should have done, what we should do, is what the Bible says we should do, what God wants us to do, and that is to repent of our sin and to forsake it. The first step in repentance is to acknowledge that you've sinned. David never does that here. He, he thought he could outsmart sin. And he thought he was smart enough to make it all go away and he could come out looking good. Well, that brings us to the second main character in the story, and that is the husband, Uriah. Now, by all accounts, Uriah is a man of honor. He, he is one of David's mighty men. He's listed as one of David's mighty men. These were... 37 of of his best fighters who have been loyal to David through all the stuff that he's gone through so far that, that, that we've talked about here in our chapels. And he has stayed with him from the time he was fleeing King Saul all the way to this pinnacle of David's success. You, you couldn't find a more loyal, faithful man than Uriah. And his closeness to David is illustrated by how close he lived to the palace. Uh, as, as one of uh, the mighty men, the, uh, the front lines that David allowed to formulate, carry out uh, the mur- murderous plot, all this points to that Uriah is not just another guy. He's not just another soldier in the army. But he's one of the elite fighting forces, one of the most loyal men that David has had. And here's another lesson for us. If and when we act honorably, which for sure Uriah did, David brings him home and, and you know tries to get him to go sleep with Bathsheba so that it would look like the, the child is, is Uriah's, and Uriah does none of that. 
He acted honorably all the way. When you do that, the lesson here is that you can infuriate people who are not acting honorably. If, if you're honorable, it could even cost you your life, as it did your life. For people who are following Jesus, this teaching is woven all throughout the New Testament. Just because we do the right thing doesn't mean it will all work out for us on this earth. And there's a lot of people out there that take scriptures and, and turn it into a, 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 a story uh, or a narrative that, boy, if you just follow Jesus, everything will be fine and you'll get every prayer you want answered the way you want it and and uh, you know the prosperity preachers will tell you that if you'll just give enough, if you'll just act honorably, that that everything uh, comes out right for you here on this earth, and, and you will have what the world calls success. I would encourage you, if you tend to believe that way, to go turn to Hebrews chapter eleven and read where men of faith and women of faith. The writer of Hebrews 11 says, some were part of conquering armies and some were sold in two. That's two different results from people acting in faith, following God. Now we do know that He's working all things out together for our good if we love Him and are called according to His purpose. But that may not demonstrate itself in this life. There are no guarantees about that in this life. So even if it doesn't, and you follow Jesus to the end, you finish your life strong, however it ends, you finish your life strong for the glory of God, Jesus tells us, great is your reward in heaven. So keep your eye on that prize. Uriah did. The bottom line here is that David is not just guilty of first lust and then adultery and even uh, to the point of being a sexual predator. He's now guilty of murder. And he and others will pay a heavy price for his sin. He thought he had got away with it. Josh is going to speak tomorrow about how he got found out. Our sins find us out. They always do. And the Bathsheba incident in the big picture leads to a shift in the, in the book of 2 Samuel's perspective. Up until now, David has largely been directing the events. And now, after this, he will become at the mercy of events. Of course, there's another major character in this account, and that is Bathsheba. By all accounts, she is as honorable as her husband Uriah. She is a very devoted wife, and uh, according to verse 26, she uh, lamented over the death of her husband, even though she's carrying the child of King David. <clears throat> She's a devoted follower of the Lord. Uh, when she was bathing, when she was seen by David, she was living according to the law of Moses, which we required her to wash herself monthly after her period ended to return to a state of spiritual readiness to create life. It was a ceremonial washing ritual. It, it was a religious ritual. And it is still observed today by Orthodox Jews. There's been a narrative spun about her that it was her immodesty that caused David to sin. That she was a, uh, like a co-conspirator here. Uh, I don't read that at all here. I read that she is, just like everybody else in this story, outside the name of David, 
that she's a victim. She's a victim of a man in a powerful position who took what he wanted when it was not his to take. That sounds pretty 21st century, doesn't it? We hear about it all the time now. Politicians, businessmen, Hollywood, and sadly, in some instances, even at the church. And it's not just limited to men. There's occasions where women are the predator. Today, I'm glad we've started calling this behavior out for what it is. So listen to me here, but men especially listen to me here because I think we're more prone to this kind of sin than the ladies. Women are not the cause of our sexual sin. We are. And we are alone. We are responsible for what we do and how we treat women. Of course, the opposite of the David's Bathsheba story is the story of Joseph in Genesis where Potiphar's wife is trying to use her position to become a sexual predator on Joseph. Joseph could have succumbed to the temptation, but he acted honorably as opposed to David, and he fled the situation. He could have said, okay, I will. And then when people ask, he'll say, well, she was the reason. But he didn't do that. So let's, let's kind of wrap that part of this study up with this idea. Regardless of the situation, we are responsible for the way that we live, and that includes in our sexuality. Well, that, that leads us to the fourth major character here and he is the third reason that this is recorded for us this is recorded for us and of course I'm referring to Jesus and I want us to turn our attention in our remaining time to Matthew chapter 1 where we find the Jewish genealogy of Jesus of all of the interesting characters and background stories in this genealogy. And I would encourage you not to skip over this genealogy when you pick up the New Testament and start to read, and, and it's this what we call boring genealogy. It's only boring if you don't know anything about the people named in the genealogy. If you know what, if you know the stories about what is named, who is named in the genealogy, th this is a fascinating. Uh, account of the lineage of Jesus. In verse 6, and here's a great example. In verse 6, we find these words. And Jesse, the father of David the king, and David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah. This may be one of the greatest ironic understatements of all of the Bible. If you know nothing about David and Bathsheba, wouldn't you find it strange that her name isn't mentioned? Well, what Matthew is doing here by recording it this way is he is summoning us to recall this tragic and terrible event in Israel's history. Why, why did he leave her name on? It, it's not a slight to her. It's a slam at David. It's to show us that out of this dysfunctional family, and if you read the genealogy, and you go back and look at the stories about the people in the genealogy, you can see that this family is totally dysfunctional. We've been doing that actually in our chapels here at the, at the Seafarers Ministry. The study of the Old Testament is the study of the genealogy of Jesus. And it all hasn't been 
this perfect family by any stretch of the imagination. It's been totally dysfunctional. And yet out of that flawed family, and out of this flawed man, in 2 Samuel chapter 11, Jesus came. The Messiah came. Out of this dysfunctional so many moral failures in this genealogy. Not just moral failures, but if you go and look and, and dig deep into the genealogy, there are cultural outsiders. There are racial outsiders. There are religious outsiders. And in the time when, when a woman's word wasn't allowed in court, there are gender outsiders. There are four ladies mentioned in this genealogy. What does that, what does that all mean for us? What, is this, what does this all mean? Because if the Old Testament, if Jesus fulfills the, the law and the prophets, and, and, and when Jesus was raised from the dead and he's walking with the two guys back to Emmaus, he's showing them out of the law and the prophets, and it's all about him. What, 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 is, what does this mean for us today? And, and to me, this is, the, this is the big lesson from the story of David and Bathsheba and from the story of all of the chapels that we have had from Genesis 1 until now. What it shows is that all people, wherever you're at, whoever you are, whatever you look like, whatever your gender is, whatever your culture is, whatever your background is, all people can be brought into God's family through Jesus. You see, in Jesus, in His genealogy, is listed a, pro a prostitute, Rahab, and a king, David. In His genealogy is listed both male and female. In his genealogy, it's not just Jewish. There are Gentiles in his genealogy. In his genealogy, there are different races. In his genealogy, there are men of morality, and as we've seen today, men of immorality. And in Jesus, all set down as equal. Equally sinful, as we all are, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And equally loved, for God so loved the world and everybody in the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever, not depending on race or creed or color or gender or religion, but whosoever, and that includes you, Believed in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. It's not just the good people that get in and the bad people that get kicked out. We're only in because Jesus died on the cross for us. And God is gracious to us. And when we receive him and believe on his name, God is not ashamed. Because of Jesus. And we become part of his family. Jew or Greek, male or Gentile, slave or free. When we receive Jesus, he gives us the right to be called the children of God. I hope you've received Jesus. I hope you are believing on his name. If you are, live as a child of God. Just like our song said at the very last today. I want to read these words again. Just start talking to Jesus. Just start talking to Jesus. Because you can talk to Jesus wherever you are. God bless you. I hope you have a good day. I hope that my prayer is that, that we get to see many of you back here at the ministry uh, in person 
in the coming months. But until then, may he bless you and keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you. May he be gracious to you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.